Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. All right. Welcome back to Fit for a Queen. We are lucky enough to have Jennifer Lombardi on with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about Jen. Jen is co-founder of Empathic Way Treatment Center in Roseville, California, an outpatient clinic that provides individual, family, and couples counseling for individuals and their loved ones struggling with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, mood disorders, and exercise compulsion. In addition to her clinical practice, Jen has also served as a national recovery advocate for Eating Recovery Center. She's the former executive director for Eating Recovery Center's California program and was a founding partner of the Sacramento office, formerly known as Summit. Eating Disorders Outreach Program. She has also been a certified fitness instructor for more than 20 years and has taught a variety of formats. Jen has extensive training in the field of eating disorders, including completing her certification in family-based therapy. She's also a certified Daring Way facilitator, training in the experiential work developed by author and research professor Dr. Brene Brown. She uses the Daring Way method, a highly experiential methodology to work with individuals struggling with shame, vulnerability, self-compassion, particularly families with clients with binge eating, eating disorder. She also enjoys travel, running, bucket list races with friends, and spending time with her high school sweetheart husband of 22 years. They're two kids, three cats, and two dogs. You have a packed house there, Jen. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. In my household, I will tell you. And also, I I need to add, I so appreciate Jen. We talk a lot about women supporting women in the workplace, and you are one of those who are very important in this field of eating disorders, but also you support other treatment providers. Um, so again, like you are, you're supporting us and coming on this podcast. So it's very important. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks for the opportunity, you guys. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, let's just get started. So please tell us a little bit about your journey into the field of therapy and working with those that struggle with an eating disorder. So my interest in eating disorders is actually very personal. Um, I know that's not unique in this field, but for me, I mean, I struggled for the better part of about five years with anorexia and compulsive exercise. And when I was able to um, recover, I, I'm just one of those hokey people that thinks things happen for a reason. And so I decided at that point to go back to graduate school and get my master's degree. And the entire time I knew I wanted to work uh, in the field. And so I, you know, I feel extremely fortunate to have an opportunity to help families and loved ones and their loved ones in a way that, unfortunately, when I was struggling, wasn't available to me at that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Such an impact probably you have um, with your clients, too, and sharing your story. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. People have said, do you think you have to be in recovery to help people with eating disorders? Mm-hmm. And I don't. Um, the therapist that I worked with for a number of years uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was had never struggled with an eating disorder, and quite honestly, at that time, um, really wasn't necessarily an eating disorder specialist per se. Um, but I would say that what she did at that time helped me a lot with um, is overcoming shame. And mm-hmm. so, you know, fast forward to a couple of years ago when I had an opportunity to do the training in the daring way, mm-hmm. um, it was such a gift because it was like it came full circle for me. So. I'm thrilled to be able to be a facilitator and help in, in disseminating that information and helping people sort of, you know, change the endings to their stories. Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk a little bit more about Shame and Brene Brown's work and um, how you're using that. So let's first talk about a little bit about compulsive exercise. This relationship with exercise um, can be a complicated one. And um, can you discuss what compulsive exercise looks like and how our culture complicates this diagnosis? 
Oh, so I think in order to, you know, unpack all of that, I think it's important to first understand sort of the foundation of why, what is compulsive exercise and how and why does that show up for individuals who are struggling with eating disorder behaviors. And I think, you know, it's important for most people to understand that there is absolutely a biological pull. Mm. Um, you know, if I take it out of the context of an eating disorder for a second and I say, okay, so, you know, Kara, if you and I were to go on the internet right now, we could find all kinds of studies that tout the merits of red wine mm-hmm. and the health benefits and the antioxidants and all of those things, right? And all of that's true, but all of that goes out the window when you're talking about applying it to somebody who has helped to develop alcoholism. Right. And so as much as it's a very much parallel process when we talk about exercise with individuals with eating disorders, because there are absolutely health benefits. Um, you know, in terms of sleep and, you know, your cholesterol levels, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, and you also have to understand that for people who struggle with eating disorder behaviors, exercise means something different. Mm -hmm. Just like that glass of wine means something different to an alcoholic. And Mm -hmm. so it's not that we want people, I think, and I'm I'm sure you guys get this too, as a, as a professional, I oftentimes will have people say, well, you just don't want me to exercise at all. I'm like, uh, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do want you to exercise. But when and how we reincorporate that into your life is everything. So we have to understand that, you know, a lot of times, you know, what people get addicted to is the endorphin high, mm-hmm. but also the emotional numb that you get through mm-hmm. exercise. And that's particularly true for cardiovascular intensive exercise. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, go ahead. Yeah. And what's so interesting, we've, we've moved into this new terminology of exercise as medicine, but that's truly the only medicine that they haven't put an upper limit on. Everything else has its suggestions don't exceed. So we've really kind of started giving messaging that territory. Right. It's that, you know, and our, our mantras are, you know, no pain, no gain. Mm-hmm. If a little is good, a lot should be better. Um, and I think in, when, we, when you were asking about cultural component, you know, that's juxtaposed to this sort of, you know, collective fear around the quote unquote obesity epidemic mm-hmm. and you know, trying to get kids to move and trying to get adults to exercise, which I understand the intention behind that, but it's exactly what you're saying that, you know, it leads to a mindset of extremes. And so there's no discussion, not enough discussion, in my opinion, about adequate rest time, recovery time, and really what balance looks like. So, you know, one of the things that I try to teach clients is, you know, it's really important for you to have a breadth of different types of exercise in your life. Mm -hmm. And so that is, you know, in in terms of intensity, duration, low, moderate, high activity levels, you want it to be diverse, um, which is kind of interesting because we we do the same thing when it comes to intuitive eating, you know, there's no such thing as a bad food and everything in moderation. And there has to be a balance. Yes, you know, I know I love that you eat fruits and vegetables, but I also need you to know how to eat fat and protein and a whole variety of things so that overall your life is more balanced Mm -hmm. and the same for exercise. Um, And so a lot of times I will have clients take inventory, like show me what you've done, show me what your preference is. And so if I have somebody who is, you know, all day, every day, cardio intensive, high intensity, I'm asking them to fill in the gaps and and sort of think of what are other activities that you'd at least be willing to try that maybe you used to like, but you sort of let go. Um, And that's a place, you know, starting point for many, many people. Mm -hmm. How do you define, I think this is such, I love that metaphor too of, uh, you know, alcohol to someone who struggles with alcoholism and exercise to someone who has an eating disorder. I think sometimes talking about that, there's an aha moment, but I still get the question like, when is too much? What is too much exercise? It is healthy, but when is it too much? How can you, how do you answer that question on an individual basis? Uh, It's tricky, right? I mean, I think, you know, the first thing is to take an inventory. Like I was saying, like, let me understand your world and then to be able to say, okay, well, what would happen if you had to take three or four rest days in a row? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, what <laughs> happens to you when you try to do that? Are you able to tolerate it? Yeah. Are you able to find other ways to manage your emotions mm-hmm. and your psychological state? Um, mm-hmm. Because if we're a one-trick pony and we're only using exercise as a means to 
you know, for stress reduction and distress tolerance, you're, you're, you're the tenant, this, you know, in my, in my world, the idea that this person is sort of moving more and more into a compulsive arena goes, starts to go up. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a really important question. The other question is, of course, you know, are you exercising when you're injured, when you're hurt, when you're sick? You choose exercise over so other social activities. Um, so I don't think there's you know one magic bullet question. Mm-hmm. I think it's a series of questions. Um, and I actually like to use there's a a really simple assessment tool called the obligatory exercise questionnaire mm-hmm. or survey. And I you know it's to me it's a, it's a conversation starter. I will give it to clients. Sometimes I'll give it to their loved ones, and I'll have them just fill it out, and then we bring it back into the session and we talk about it um, because. You know, I think if if the person is is unable or unwilling to open the door to rest, more balance, more diverse exercises, and you know, doesn't really isn't really willing to let it go in terms of having an opportunity to engage in other social activities or try other distress tolerance tools. Mm-hmm to me is feeling much more compulsive. Yeah, I agree. That indicator of asking, how does it feel to take a rest day or two or three in a row? And how much anxiety does that bring for you? I mean, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. I I usually duck my head real quick after I ask that question. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, you take a rest day. (laughs) You know, and it's hard. I mean, I think one of the things that I like to do sometimes is an experiential exercise where we'll get little, you know, like little post-its and on each post-it, we'll write, in one bowl, we'll have a whole variety of activities and exercise from low, moderate, high, put them in a bowl, and then in another bowl, put time. So zero, you know, and and all the way up to 45 minutes or whatever's appropriate. And in that bowl of activities, there are post-its that have the words rest days put mm-hmm. on there. And we will have them do draws, random draws, like <laughs> this is what you're going to do for the next seven days. And I've had people draw seven rest days. Oh, and wow. so, you know... That's a really tough, <laughs> but it's also eye-opening for them yeah. that they recognize. Oh my gosh, I really don't know what to do with myself mm-hmm. if I can't go to the gym. Mm-hmm. It's scary. We'll be yeah. sure to put that scale on our show notes in case anybody questions if they may um, suffer from compulsive exercising too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Great. Can you explain a little bit more about um, Brene Brown's work um, and the concept you include in working with those with body image and exercise related issues? Tell us a little bit more about Brene and what your work that you're doing. Yeah, so I'm a certified Daring Wave facilitator. So what that means is about two years ago, um, my business partner and I went to a four day training um, in San Antonio, Texas in July, which if anybody's never been to San Antonio in July, you should check it out. <laughs> Really mild to climate, not. Um, so we were there, <laughs> and it was. You know, I'm going to say the hokey thing that most people, you know, kind of may roll their eyes a little bit at. But it was. It was absolutely fundamentally life changing for me. Mm-hmm. It changed how I, you know, communicate in my own family. It and it absolutely has changed how I work with clients. One of the um, pieces of curriculum that they provide to us as facilitators. So we we go through all of the books, and then there is a set of curriculum that comes with Daring Greatly, and also one with her book Rising Strong. And in the curriculum, um, in the Daring Greatly in the work, there is a particular piece called um, Idealized and Unwanted Identities. And to be very candid. I, you know, for years, I was a little frustrated as a clinician um, when we would talk about body acceptance and body image issues. I mean, I am, I am definitely an experiential person. I like to do things that are creative and interactive, but I was finding it to be a little bit stale and a little bit like we're not getting to the heart of the matter. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of tossing at people, love your body and accept your body and yeah, I just think I think back to when I was struggling, I would have rolled my eyes at that and thought, you have clearly don't understand what this is all about. Um, but there's this piece of curriculum where she talks about, you know, we all carry these sort of idealized and unwanted identities. And the idealized identity is actually even above and beyond what we perceive it to be. Um, and they're both rooted in shame and they travel in pairs in that way. So an example, so I'm a mom and as a mom, you know, I carry around, whether I'm aware of it or not, this idealized mom identity, mm-hmm. right? So I want to be patient. I want to show up. I never want for my kids to 
question my love for them. I have all of these sort of glowing, you know, wonderful things that I'm always trying to hold. Um, but it's not, it's not possible, right? We can't be the, it's trying to, you know, in a way it's sort of saying, I want to be the perfect mom. Yeah. That's impossible, mm-hmm. right? And it's actually not healthy because if you are kids that, you know, we're, we're fallible too and it's okay. Um, but we're constantly hustling and scrambling, trying to achieve this ideal. And the problem is, is that the moment that we feel like we've failed, it's not just, oh, I messed up in this situation. It's I'm the worst mother in the world. Right. And so I drop down to this unwanted identity. And both of them, it's sort of like you're sandwiched in, in between a perfectionistic viewpoint and a shame-based viewpoint. One where I just feel like I'm a horrible, awful person, almost catastrophizing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, applying sort of that that framework to, you know, my my healthy self or my fit self um, I think really has been helpful with clients um, because, you know, if I'm working with an athlete and he or she says, you know, well, I, you know, I have to be the best, you know, track runner and I have to go to UCLA and I have to get a scholarship and I have to be number one on that team. Like at what point is it enough? Mm-hmm. And in the pursuit of that, what do you lose? Right. And how much do you lose yourself in that? And when you don't achieve that, what, what is, what's the language inside your head? What's the narrative? What are you telling yourself? And for most people, it's, it's not, well, you know, I gave it my best shot. It's, I suck and I'm a horrible mm-hmm. athlete and I, I can't even believe UCLA let me in in the first place. So we bounce between these two really harsh um, sort of, you know, idealizations. And it's, it's really painful for mm-hmm. a lot of people. And I think it's an important conversation to have that, you know, what is it I really want? Mm-hmm. And what, and in the pursuit of that, there's a difference between perfectionism and a pursuit for excellence. And the perfectionism is all about, you know, what are people going to think? What's going to happen if I don't achieve this? Um, and, and I think that when we, when it comes to exercise in our culture, those messages get provided to us <laughs> all day. Oh yeah. True. Without a doubt. Yeah. I love that. The difference between perfection and the pursuit of excellence. That's a very good point to, to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. I, Cause I think, you know, when we have no pain, no gain as a mantra, you know, it's, there's, I mean, I, I, as a fitness instructor, I hear this all the time, you know, I have to go get on the treadmill. I'm like, why do you have to, mm-hmm. like, do you really like it? You know, if it's not something you want to do, what, what would it look like to find something that you really enjoy? Because that's probably going to be more sustainable than a have to mm-hmm. or feeling like you're forced to and constantly comparing to what you perceive in other people um, as far as being fit or being healthy or strong or whatever the, you know, the descriptor is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really connecting to that and thinking about how many decisions are made that we make every day based on shame versus based on what we actually want to do. I think that's so important to look at, right? Right. Mm-hmm. True. You know, it's, it's a gift as an instructor. It's kind of funny. I mean, I think a long time ago, people at the gym that I teach at have learned, don't ask Jen what she thinks about certain diets or crazy exercises. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you the answer that maybe you're looking for. Um, and I think it's, you know, we have to, figure out what is the, you know, is it the social component? Is it the, you know, the experience that I get to have a feeling accomplished? Um, is it, I get to, you know, turn off my brain for a little while. Is it that I like to be outside? It, to me, it's finding where are your values showing up in exercise? Because if those aren't there, then I think you're right, Kara. I think absolutely that's where shame really starts to creep in mm-hmm. and we're not being very self-compassionate. Yeah, for sure. So Jen, on your journey to recovery, there's obviously been quite a transformation in your relationship with exercise. Exercise. Would you mind sharing with us what that journey looked like and why you've made it a mission to share this with others? Yeah, I mean, I think early on um, when I was working towards recovery, I think my recovery was more about I want. I was able to make peace with food more so initially, I, you know, what I would eat and quantity and all of those things that we have to encounter in in the process of recovery. I feel like I was able to make a a lot of headway in that. But what creeped in at the end for me was exercise. 
And I sort of struck a deal. I call it, you know, striking a deal with the devil that I'll, I'll keep eating and I'll be mm-hmm. healthy, but I, I need to, I need to exercise or I'll gain weight, but it needs muscle. Um, and so there absolutely was this window of time um, where exercise really became a substitute in many ways. Now, I, I say that now, I don't think I would have owned that back then. I think it would have, you would have been hard pressed to convince me. Um, and part of that was because our culture, you know, and what the messages are around exercise. And part of it was, I liked the high that I was, I would get from working out. Um, but, you know, it, it, over time, I think I would find myself kind of getting burned out with certain things. And I would feel a lot of dread around having to go to the gym or having to go for a run. And it was, again, that language of I have to. Um, but, you know, my internal dialogue, of course, was, well, you're just being lazy and, you know, you need to suck it up. And this is how people fall back into bad habits. And I had all of this justification for why I had to push myself to do something that I wasn't necessarily super excited to do. And so, you know, when I went through at one point I decided, you know, through a series of events, I had an opportunity to become an instructor and I went through the training and it wasn't too far into teaching that I started, you know, it was sort of, it was like in my face a little bit. I would have members come up after a class or whatnot, and they would always want to ask questions about, you know, what do you think about this diet? And, you know, how do I do, you know, spot reduction? I want my thigh to look a little differently. And I, I think in a way it was kind of like its own exposure therapy. I was like, I was hearing myself through the comments that they were sharing with me, thinking that, you know, whatever their perception was of me, but I'm sitting there kind of like, oh my gosh, that thinking still exists in my brain and I still sort of align with that. So it was a little bit of a wake up call. And so I I did go back into therapy and work through a lot of that. Um, And I, you know, I had to kind of develop a mantra, you know, that, if there was no joy, then it was a no-go, period. If I didn't have joy in it and it wasn't something that lit me up inside, I really had to challenge myself to not do it. Um, so I remember turning down class opportunities to teach. Um, I had been teaching a bunch of different formats. I didn't necessarily like all of them. And I thought, you know, nope, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that go. I'm only going to do the stuff that excites me and makes me laugh. Um, you know, and I'm thrilled that some of the members that I started teaching back then, I, 15 years later, like they saw me when I was pregnant with my first child. Um, and it's just, it's a gift because it's a family, but I, and I've had some of those members reach out to me and say, you know, I really appreciate it because I never worry, you know, if I've missed class for a few weeks, it's not, there's not going to be this walk of shame coming back into your class or, Thank you for, you know, the stuff you post on social media about, you know, exercise for joy and making us laugh in class. Because to me, that's really the most important thing. That's my, for me, I had to figure out one of my values in exercise is the the social component Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of giving back. Um, Those are the two things that are, are super important to me in that journey. Oh, that's great. So we like to wrap up our episodes hearing from our guests how they live out the fit philosophy every day. So how do you juggle the balance between performance, health, intellect, and taking that time for self? Oh, so I think, you know, the bucket <laughs> list thing is huge for me um, because, you know, I do run um, and I have some friends that I like to go running with. Um, as a side note, I've, I've, I would, the other thing I would like to say really quickly, I think, you know, when it comes to, if there are runners or people that do activities with other folks, I think it's okay to pull back from people who engage in activities that are not necessarily conducive to your recovery. Mm-hmm. So I don't do a lot of time with Fitbit people and Garmin people. I mean, somebody's asked me, do you have a Garmin? I will say yes, but I only use it if I'm having a difficult time slowing myself down and I don't want to burn out. But outside of that, I don't use those measures. It's not about how fast did you run this and how, you know, what was your split time and all of that. So I think, you know, in terms of performance, I, you know, for me, I like to do bucket list races. Um, that's where I get, you know, excited. And so one of my favorite ones is uh, a friend of mine and I did one of the Disney races where they actually uh-huh. the parks and you get to run through and we were stopping along the way and taking pictures of the characters. 
so to me, that it's a challenge, you know? And so, you know, can I rise to that challenge? And if I got injured, I wouldn't run it. But if I didn't and I felt good, then we're going. So that, you know, performance to me is you have to be, you have to find the reasons why. And so for me, it was the fun of it and being able to do that. Um, I think as far as, you know, health and intellect. So to me, this is a language thing. It's a narrative thing. I think, you know, a lot of us, when we, we're, if we're engaging in an activity and we find ourselves struggling a little bit, either due to fatigue or, or whatever it is, I, I think we start beating ourselves up. You know, I know a lot of athletes that if they've had an injury, let's say in their, you know, their quadricep or their knee, they'll start talking to that and saying, you know, come on, you know, you know what's wrong with you, you stupid knee? They have this negative dialogue. And I say to them, you know, are you talking to, whether it's a body part or to yourself, the way you would talk to somebody you love? And if you're not... Think about what you would say to somebody who's in recovery from an injury or coming back from being sick. How would you talk to them? Now try to do that for yourself. Um, so to me, that's the, the health component, the balance piece. Um, and I, you know, again, like I said before, I think being able to have a mantra, I don't believe in no pain, no gain. I believe in is, you know, it's a question. Is there any joy? And if not, then there, it's, if there's no joy, then there's no go. I'm mm-hmm. not going to plain and simple. And I think you have to give yourself permission to do that. I like that. Yeah. Love that. Thanks. Carrie, you and I need to do a Disney marathon. <laughs> I know I would love to do that. It's actually been on my list. I love they give like different kind of medals for the distances. It's yeah, yeah. it's on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. It's super fun. It's super fun. It's very early in the morning, but Ooh, I, I don't know then. Uh. Like <laughs> Mickey Mouse at the end, like, come on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, Jen, thank you so much for um, joining us today. You brought some great insight on exercise and balance. And again, thank you for your own vulnerability and sharing your story. So please, if you want to know more about Jen, her program and services, go to www.empathicway.com. Again, thanks so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you to our sponsor today, Sentimano Counseling. Sentimano Counseling is the premier perinatal mental health practice in Kansas City, treating mood disorders during pregnancy and postpartum, perinatal loss, infertility, eating, and exercise disorders. Go to sentimano.com for further information about the practice and services. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fit for queen and Hashtag fit for a queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, queen.